Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us on our Ask the Doctor series coming to you from Eminent Health. Uh, Eminent Health focuses on important topics which can affect the communities it serves on a periodic basis. Today, we're going to discuss about diabetes type 2. My name is Gurjeet Kalkat. I'm the Chief Medical Officer. Uh, pardon my raspy voice, not COVID laryngitis, uh, but I'm, I'm doing well. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier that we are going to discuss about diabetes. Diabetes is one of the, one of probably the most significant health conditions in our communities. And unfortunately, the, the incidence, the prevalence is increasing. We're not very certain why, but environment, obesity contributes to that. Uh, not only uh, diabetes is a common disease, but it has a very, very negative correlations, implications with health if not managed appropriately, whether it's related to strokes, heart attacks, kidney disease, eye disease, limb disease. So it's very important that we know everything we can about diabetes. Today, we, with us, we have Dr. Bashar Saad. He's a board certified endocrinologist. He's been serving our community for about 14 years. He's going to discuss about diabetes type 2. He'll make his presentation, and then after the presentation, we'll have uh, questions from the audience. So without further ado, Dr. Vishal. Thank you, Koji. I'm going to talk about the current management of type 2 diabetes mellitus. So we'll start with definition of diabetes mellitus. Diabetes is the definition of a persistent hyperglycemia. We make the diagnosis if the fasting blood sugar exceed 126 milligram per deciliter on two occasions, or if the random plasma glucose is more than 200 in addition to the symptom, the classic symptoms of hyperglycemia, which is being a lot, drinking a lot of water, weight loss, or by doing hemoglobin A1C, and the number would be more than 6.5 on two occasions. The uh, presenting symptoms, uh, when we have insulin deficiency, we have hyperglycemia, and the uh, symptoms that we see uh, are polyuria, mean peeing a lot, polydipsia, mean uh, uh, drinking a lot of water and or uh, fluid, and polyphagia. If it is severe impairment of insulin uh, deficiency, at that time we see impaired in the lipid and the protein. Uh, metabolism and that can lead to infection, it can lead to weight loss and even the uh, uh, ketoacidosis as well. Who should we screen for type 2 diabetes? Diabetes mellitus is a common disease and the primary prevention, it's really very important. I believe and I, you know, I always when I lecture I talk about pre-diabetes as a cardiovascular disease and the screening is visible and can detect a preventable stage. When we get to the diabetes, we're talking about the complication, a chronic complication which include stroke, heart attack, uh, peripheral vascular disease, uh, amputation, uh, peripheral uh, neuropathy, uh, nephropathy mean involvement of the kidney, involvement of the eyes, uh, and the blindness, retinopathy. All of these uh, can be uh, prevented by early detection of the disease and to treat the disease appropriately. Who should we screen? All adults who are overweight and usually BMI more than 23 in Asian or more than 25 in everyone else and usually if we have patient who, is, who has a sedentary lifestyle, if there is significant family history of diabetes, high ethnicity, uh, high risk in uh, some race and ethnicity group like African American, women who had delivered baby more than nine pounds, or they have documented diabetes during the pregnancy, we name it gestation diabetes, if there is hypertension or dyslipidemia, uh, low HDL, uh, if there is a polycystic ovarian syndrome in the woman, if there is A1C between 5.7 to 6.5 in this situation, we name it a pre-diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance, where if we do 
a glucose tolerance test, the blood sugar after giving the 75 uh, gram of glucose or after food will be between 140 to 199 or impaired fasting glucose when uh, the blood sugar fasting between 100 to 125. Uh, uh, if there is a, a severe obesity, of course, uh, obesity is a major risk factor for diabetes type 2. And if there is history of uh, cardiovascular disease, when we talk about the pathophysiology, I mean the causes of type 2 diabetes, multi-organs involve in the development of type 2 diabetes mellitus will start at the level of the pancreas when there is decrease in the insulin secretion from the islet cell, the cell which produce insulin. And also there are another cells in the pancreas that produce glucagon. There is increase in the glucagon secretion. And that can lead to hyperglycemia. Also we have resistant of the action of the hormone insulin at the level of muscle and fat and what we name it by decrease glucose uptake in these tissues. We we have the kidney involved by increasing the reabsorption of glucose from the kidney will contribute to the hyperglycemia and increasing the glucose production from the liver uh, and that's what we name it by uh, gluconeogenesis and that's uh, you know happen uh, as a major contribute to the development of type 2 diabetes mellitus and now we're talking about incretin effect which is hormone secreted from the small intestine and contribute to the uh, uh, secretion of insulin and uh, controlling the glucagon as well. What are the target goals for us for the uh, hemoglobin A1C in managing diabetes? And there is, it depends, we always individualize when we treat diabetic patients. ADA, American Diabetic Association, recommend an A1C less than 7. ACE or the uh, American Academy of Clinical Endocrinology recommend an A1C less than 6.5 for patients without concurrent serious illness and who had low risk for uh, hypoglycemia. And the same, you know, uh, society recommend an A1C more than 6.5 for patient uh, who has uh, concurrent serious illness or at high risk for, hyper, uh, for hypoglycemia. And the, uh, what we learn from the uh, multiple trials, one of them, the DCCT trial, that an A1C more than 7 will increase the complication, in particular microvascular, mean the eye disease, retinopathy, the kidney disease, nephropathy, and the proteinuria and microalbuminuria, and involvement of the uh, nerve, what we name it by neuropathy, and numbness tingling in the feet. When we talk about the management of diabetes, always we start with lifestyle, lifestyle changes, modification of lifestyle, weight optimization, healthy diet. We can't talk about the medication without talking about diet and exercise. Lifestyle intervention is very important to recognize this aspect. It's extremely important for the management of diabetes, in particular type 2 diabetes. And here I start by putting this, no one size fits all. The diet we recommend, Mediterranean diet is a great diet, low carb diet, vegetarian diet, or plant-based diet. Referral to a dietitian will control, will decrease the hemoglobin A1C by 23 to 2%. In my opinion, the best diet is Mediterranean. That's my opinion. In general, what we recommend as a diet, important to avoid the processed foods, high fiber, I was reading actually with my wife yesterday about high fiber. It's, high fiber can decrease the glucose production from the liver. It can decrease the emptying of the stomach uh, of the food. So really it will, it's very important in controlling the blood sugar, decreasing the insulin resistant and improving inflammation. And that's, you know, in, it's very important to include the high fiber in the diet for diabetic patient and probably for everybody else. And the other things is uh, no uh, avoid uh, simple sugar, you know, uh, giving uh, fruit, uh, vegetable, whole grain is very important to control, to uh, add it to the diet. Now here we have numerous uh, medication available for the treatment of type 2 diabetes mellitus. 
In general, we have metformin. You know, we all of us use metformin. Two-thirds of diabetic patients on metformin. Sulfonylurea, we have a glipizide, a glimberide, a glyberide. A glinide, they are short-acting. Um, sulfonylurea, we have TZD actose, DPP-4 inhibitor like Genovia, like uh, Tragenta. Uh, alpha glucoside is inhibitor, we use uh, very little of it, like Precosa. Uh, dopamine agonist, also we use uh, very little of it, uh, it's a promocryptine. And uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist, we'll talk more about it, GIP and GLP-1 uh, receptor uh, agonist, we'll talk more about it, uh, and we have SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, and I'm going to uh, here uh, concentrate uh, on the most recommended uh, non-insulin diabetic medication, metformin, one of them. The second one, glucagon, like polypeptide, one receptor agonist, like uh, trulicetir, like uh, we have uh, ripalsis as oral medication, and subcutaneous injection, ozempic, GIP and GLP-1 receptor. GLP-1 is a glucagon-like polypeptide, one receptor antibodies, uh, I'm sorry, receptor agonist, and GIP is a glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide. Both of these are incretin producer from the small intestine and help in controlling the blood sugar. And this medication is terzepatite, Monjaro. SGLT2 inhibitor like Invocana, Forsiga, Jardians, uh, these are sodium glucose co-transport uh, to inhibitor. We'll talk about this group in a little bit. We'll start with metformin. Metformin is the most commonly used therapy. It will lower its potent. It will lower the A1C by 1 to 2 percent. It is safe. There is no risk of hypoglycemia, no weight gain with it. Dose, it's usually 2,000 milligram per day. Side effect, mostly GI, diarrhea, nausea, up to 10% of the people will complain uh, from GI side effect. We see vitamin B12 deficiency uh, um, after using it for five years. Uh, the other things, uh, it showed actually lower cardiovascular uh, risk in obese patients. And uh, there is uh, extensive clinical, it has been in the market in the United States since 1995. Uh, and it's very inexpensive, it's cheap. And uh, there is a question mark, uh, favorable impact, impact on cancer risk and mortality. GLP-1, which is a glucagon-like polypeptide 1, it works on multiple organs. It will work on the stomach to decrease the emptying of the stomach so the patient will feel, uh, you know, his full satiety. It will work on the pancreas by increasing the insulin secretion and decrease the glucagon, and that will contribute to a, a postprandial improvement of the blood sugar. It will decrease the production of a glucose from the liver and has good effect on the heart. It will increase the contractility, increase cardiac uh, output, and uh, has uh, cardio protection. In addition, it will work on the hypothalamus in the brain uh, and decreasing the appetite. Uh, The benefit of it, it's a potent medication. It will improve the A1C by 1 to 2 percent. It has weight loss. The weight loss, we'll talk about it uh, probably in the end of this uh, uh, presentation. But in general, it will drop the weight between 1.5 to 3 kilogram. With Monjaro, we see a drop 22 percent. With Ozempic, we see a drop by 12.5 percent of the weight. There is no risk of hypoglycemia with the GLP-1 analog when it's used by itself or with metformin, uh, unless you combine it with sulfonylurea or you combine it with insulin. And if the, somebody is on insulin and we add a GLP-1 analog like the Trulicity or Ozempica or Monjaro, we decrease the amount of insulin required. The side effect the potential hypoglycemia, we talked about it, uh, it doesn't happen unless you add it to uh, insulin or sulfonylurea. GI side effect, the most common, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, up to 10% to uh, even, you know, nausea, 18%. Uh, and uh, in uh, Biduran xenotide, uh, we have nodule at the side of the uh, uh, injection. What about the concern? Every patient comes to the office and I start them on GLP-1. They talk about pancreatic uh, uh, cancer, pancreatitis, and medullary thyroid cancer. 
Really, the incidence of pancreatic cancer and the incidence of pancreatitis is higher in diabetic patient. It's doubled, actually. And what it showed here, let me go back. So it is more frequent in type 2. And the relationship between the GLP-1 and between the uh, pancreatic cancer is really not well understood and probably the risk is very near. So usually if there is history of pancreatitis, I will probably not use the product. Or if the patient has high risk for pancreatitis, probably I will not use the product. But in general, the link between both is, or it is the cause, is very near and usually we don't see often in the clinical practice. Medullary thyroid cancer, it happened, this is a rare cancer of the thyroid, where it happened this cancer on what's called it by C cell uh, in the thyroid. And the exposure of, GLP, um, of the GLP-1 in rats showed increased the incidence of medullary thyroid cancer. And the reason for that, the receptor of GLP-1 in the thyroid in rats is very high. So, and especially in the C cell, in a human, the expression is very low and there are no, or the risk of medullary cancer in a human with the use of GLP-1 is really uh, very and very near and usually we didn't see uh, cases. Uh, they did a lot of studies uh, in MD Anderson and in big, you know, uh, uh, center, cancer center, and really the link did, was not, uh, uh, you know, important to uh, discuss it, but if the patient worry about medullary cancer, or if there is a family history of, th uh, of medullary thyroid cancer, or family history, what we name it by multi-endocrine neoplasm, at that time we're not using the product. So the bottom line, do not use this product in patient if there is high risk of pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer. Do not use it if there is high risk or history of medullary thyroid cancer. For other patients, absolute risk appear to be nil and low, and probably not important. The second medication, which is important, what we call it by sodium glucose co-transporter uh, inhibitor, and these receptors are in the kidney. It works to reabsorb glucose from the kidney. When we block it with this medication, we increase the diuresis of glucose and we decrease the reabsorption of the sugar, and that's lead to improvement in the hyperglycemia. We have uh, in Vocana, we have... Um, for Sega, we have Jardians and we have Steglato. Now, the effect, the benefit, it's, it will work independent of the islet cell, of the beta cell, and it will drop the A1C between 0.6 to 1%. There is a drop in the way to drop in the systolic blood pressure. And now the talk about the I mean, uh, the benefit of this uh, product in congestive heart failure, it showed decrease uh, hospitalization and death from congestive heart failure. It showed decrease uh, the death from cardiovascular disease in patients with diabetes and uh, cardiovascular event, and it showed benefit uh, in chronic kidney disease. In particular, we're talking about uh, Farxiga and Jardians. Uh, the side effect that we see, mycotic genital infection, volume depletion, always when I start patient on this group of medication, I ask them to drink, uh, you know, a good amount of uh, fluid, in particular water. In general, you know, if the GFR, if the kidney function is declining and it is less than 45, usually this product will not work as well. But it has been approved to use it if the GFR more than 30, and if it is only for renal problem, I mean renal protection, or for heart protection, we can use this product uh, if the uh, uh, GFR more than 20. Adverse effect, mostly we talk about genital fungal infection, we talk about UTI, which is rare, uh, peeing a lot, polyuria. Renal failure, it reported mostly volume depletion if the patient become dehydrated, not drinking a lot of water, and the skin infection, what we call, what we call uh, before near gangrene, has been reported not common. 
Now, uh, I'm not going to talk about this slide. This is the different kind of medication and the amount of uh, the degree of the A1C drop with it. And in particular, I will emphasize on insulin. You know, when we add insulin, especially if the A1C, let us say in type 2, more than 10, we add basal insulin. In the drop in the A1C could be by three or more of the A1C, uh, uh, dropping in the uh, hemoglobin A1C by more than 3%. Metformin, we talked about it, dropped by 1.5%. Actos dropped by 1.5%. SGLT2 dropped by 1%. GLP1 will drop by 1.5%. Uh, now, this is slide, I like this slide. And that's the move now. How can we treat obese patients with type 2 diabetes? Number one, metformin, I like metformin, I still like metformin. 2,000 milligram daily. I minimize the use of insulin. I minimize the use of TZD and sulfonylurea. And I add GLP-1 or GIP, GLP-1 like Monjaro uh, or GLP-1 or Zempeca. And uh, I will add later on SGLT2 inhibitor. The problem always when I talk to physician about this, they will say the cost. And yes, we cannot treat, uh, you, you know, we have to consider the cost of this uh, product. This is slide, uh, if the patient has, if diabetic patient type 2, has a vascular disease or congestive heart failure or chronic kidney disease, we like to put them on SGLT2 like Jardians or um, Jardians or uh, Foxiga. And if there is coronary artery disease, probably GLP-1 analog or SGLT2. If the A1C not at goal, we add to the metformin different medication, depends on the cost. If we want to minimize the cost at that time, we can add sulfonylurea, TZD, or insulin. For the weight, weight loss, it's very important when we talk about the diabetes, type 2 diabetes, we're talking about controlling the blood sugar, but also we don't want hypoglycemia and we don't want weight gain. And we have two GLP-1 slash GIP, very important medication in the weight loss. It's terzepeptide, it's Bonjaro, and the second one, G, uh, the glucagon-like polypeptide, ozempic semiglutide. And both, they are very potent in the weight loss and potent in dropping the blood sugar as well. The second, uh, uh, I mean, the second medication, which also, also will be important, uh, and it controls the blood sugar and will help in weight loss, are the uh, Victoza and the trulicity intermittent effect on the weight loss, uh, the uh, GLP-1, other than what I mentioned above, and the SGLT-2. Cost is an issue always, uh, so always we have to discuss it with the patient, and we have to choose uh, one or two of these medications that the patient can afford. And of course, we like everybody to be on metformin, GLP-1, and SGLT-2, but sometimes the cost is an issue, and that's one of the obstacles uh, obstacle that we face. Take home points. All adults should be screened for diabetes to start at age 35. And you may screen before age 35 if there are other risk factors and then we can screen every three years thereafter. Very important, nutrition, exercise, exercise, aerobic, anaerobic, 75 to 150 minutes per week are very important. High fiber diet, still high fiber diet is very important to stick with the diet and exercise. And we are not only looking at the number for the diabetic patient, we look at what other comorbidity, if there is heart disease, if there is congestive heart failure, probably in this situation we use uh, Jardins or Foxiga. If there is a problem with the kidney, renal failure, we use Foxiga or uh, Jardins in addition to, uh, you know, the other medication. And now we can use this product even if the A1C normal, even if the patient not diabetic for the benefit of the, uh, for the benefit of the heart and the kidney. Not all therapy is sequential. It's very important, you know, in the past we use, okay, start one medication and then after three months, uh, let's uh, add another medication. Now, if the A1C is, let us say, more than nine, we may need to do an or a triple medication to start with. And if the A1C more than 10, we need, to, and the patient has a classic symptoms of uh, hyperglycemia, we need to add insulin. 
Monjaro is very effective in the weight loss and the glycemia. It's important when we intensify the treatment of glycemia to monitor the eyes and send the, you know, send the patient to ophthalmologist, to eye doctor, to check for retinopathy. Because if there is background, mean early retinopathy, and you drop the blood sugar uh, quickly, it may worsen the retinopathy, and that's important. The last slide is about NASH and uh, liver uh, and elevated liver function tests. We see combination between type 2 and elevated liver function tests, uh, what we call it by fatty liver. And uh, what it showed uh, that pioglitazone actos, GLP-1 analogs, and metabolic surgery have been all shown to reduce the NASH. NASH means there is non-alcoholic uh, steatohepatitis, means there is inflammation, which is you know, can progress to cirrhosis and even uh, other bad, you know, things in the liver like cancer. SGLT2 inhibitor may be important to uh, reduce the elevation of liver function test in non-alcoholic uh, uh, fatty liver without inflammation. The effect of SGLT2 on NASH is uh, probably uh, less, uh, there are less evidence of, uh, to support the use of SGLT2 in NASH. I'm going to stop here and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Saad. Very comprehensive review. We're very fortunate that we have so many choices now. And 10 years ago, there were very few drugs available, but there's been an explosion of new drugs which are very, very powerful in so many ways. So we take some questions now. Um, uh, what is A1C? This is a listener who's not uh, a physician. Hemoglobin A1C, uh, it will assess the blood sugar in a three months period. Usually, uh, hemoglobin is, you know, what carries the blood, and the lifespan of hemoglobin, of hemoglobin is three months. So usually the sugar can bind to the protein in the hemoglobin, and by measuring the hemoglobin A1C, can assess, we can assess the average of blood sugar in a three months period, which is the lifespan of the hemoglobin. A very important um, test, which uh, endocrinologists use to diagnose and monitor diabetes. No doubt. Next question is, what is, can you, give, can you comment on sugar substitutes? Yeah, sugar substitutes, uh, you know, briefly I would say limit the use of all, uh, you know, sugar substitutes. Uh, there are some reports recently published about worsening insulin resistant with sugar substitute. So here, if you want to use it, I do not have a, you know, a favor for one over the other, but to probably I will say use it in limited amount more than anything else. Thanks. Next one is, you mentioned pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer increasing in diabetes type 2 patient. Should one be screened for pancreatic? pancreatic cancer or pancreatitis, yeah, it's, uh, and, and if there's any recommendation on that. Yeah, there is no such recommendation. The problem is, as I mentioned, pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer are more common, almost double, in diabetic patient comparing to uh, non-diabetic. The problem is, uh, like here, if we measure, let us say, and this is, you know, we see it as a consult from other physicians, if you measure the amylase lipase, it could be mildly elevated with the use of GLP-1, the glucagon-like polypeptide. So I will, you know, I will advise not to measure the, uh, you know, not to monitor the lipase or amylase unless there are, you know, there is a risk, mean uh, there is a abdominal pain and a uh, picture of pancreatitis. Doing CT and MRI, you know, how often you're going to do it. So really, there is no recommendation on screening. I hate pancreatic cancer, but again, there is no such recommendation at this time to, uh, you know, to monitor or to, uh, to do it, you know, other than, uh, of course, symptoms are very important in this situation more than anything else. Thanks. Uh, and then compared to, as you mentioned, the patient will start having abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and pain in the disposal of breastbone, indicating inflammation of the pancreas. Uh, another viewer wanted to know what are the common symptoms of diabetes? The symptoms of diabetes, a lot of time they will have no symptoms. The symptoms of the diabetes will appear when the blood sugar exceeds 180. At that time, 
they will start being, uh, you know, diabetes actually, the Greek word of diabetes is siphon, means something running. And mellitus is honey. This is the definition of diabetes mellitus, uh, something running. So polyuria means peeing a lot. And because uh, there is dehydration, the patient will drink uh, more water. So we name it polyuria and polydipsia, mean drinking a lot of water and peeing a lot. Weight loss, because when the sugar dumped in the urine, there is less calorie. And we have, you know, fat and the protein, you know, a, a catabolism in the situation, being a breakdown of the fat and the protein. At that time, we see with severe, you know, when the A1C is going higher and higher, weight loss. And sometimes the change in the blood sugar can cause also a blurry vision. So mostly what we see is a weight loss, a blurry vision, uh, polyuria mean peeing a lot, and polydipsia uh, mean drinking a lot of water. Uh, of course, you know, a lot of time the patient will go for a physical exam and random blood work will be elevated and they are not aware that they have diabetes. And that's very, uh, very common. Sometimes, you know, patients will go to neurologists with numbness tingling in the feet with neuropathy, and then they do the A1C, it will be elevated. So sometimes they have no symptoms. So. Thanks. Um, to the question about screening, the um, viewer is asking what kind of screening process would it be like? Can we a CAT scan with a contrast? One can also do an MRI of the abdomen to screen it. But as uh, Dr. Saad mentioned, there are no current guidelines on how whether to screen or how often to screen. Yeah, I'm not aware of any, uh, you know, recommendation regarding the screening. Uh, and as I said, uh, the problem is uh, if you screen, you're going to do CT every year, which is, you know, you're going to have a lot of radiation and expenses. Uh, and th at the same time, I, I don't think uh, there is recommendation for screening for pancreatic cancer at this time. Next question is how often should one screen for NASH, uh, so called, also called fatty liver. Uh, this, uh, any comments about this? Well, it is a, it's very common, and we see more and more of fatty liver. And even there are some uh, patients with fatty liver and normal liver function tests, uh, and we see it by chance on the sonogram. But here, what I recommend is obtaining, you know, when you go to the physician, usually they do the liver function test and they look at, you know, if the liver function tests are elevated, they have to rule out other causes of abnormal liver function test. And if there is diabetes, you know, it is like weight loss is very important. Um, probably a referral to a gastroenterologist to rule out other causes, doing a sonogram of the abdomen, looking at the CBC, at the platelet count, and we name it by fibrosis, you know, calculating the fibrosis score will be important. And weight loss is very important, GLP-1 analog, as I mentioned, you know, in my, during my lecture, you know, about the GLP-1 and improvement of the NASH is very important. Next one is on the diet. Why do you recommend Mediterranean diet over low carb slash vegetarian plant based diet? Okay, that's important. I need my wife. So anyway, um, here Mediterranean diet has been tried for so long, and it showed cardiovascular protection. And the reason for that, it has fish rich in omega three, olive oil monounsaturated, um, nuts, seeds, red wine, all of this, uh, it showed cardiovascular protection. Now, uh, it's a combined uh, diet with, you know, and it has uh, fruit, a lot of vegetable, uh, no processed food. Uh, comparing with, if we take very low carb, it's very hard to sustain it. And I have a problem with, probably it will end up with high fat and elevation of the cholesterol with very low uh, carb. Again, you know, very low carb, it may help in the weight loss. But again, if you do a very low carb, you need to be careful not to eat a lot of fat. And that's the problem. And, you know, looking at the LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol. That's why, in you know, low carb, you know, all are options. All are on the table and they are good options. I favor, you know, as I said, the Mediterranean because of the cardiovascular protection. Thanks. 
Next is comment on the, the statins, uh, drugs for high cholesterol cause diabetes. Yeah, that's a very important question. The, <coughs> the, the recommendation now, all type 2 diabetic patient should be on statin. As diabetes is cardiovascular disease. Still, the number one cause of death in diabetic patient is cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease. So we need to do prevention. And statin showed a prevention from cardiovascular disease. We like the LDL, cholesterol, at least to be less than 100. And that's hard to achieve without a statin. Now, can statin increase the blood sugar? There is some about rosuvastatin, Crestor, and increase of blood sugar is very minimal. And really, I don't think it is uh, significantly to prevent us from using statin in such patients. Good, thanks. It's very important to know. Next one is um, use of supplements like turmeric and cinnamon in controlling blood sugars. Yeah, I have no problem if the patient wants to take it, but I do not recommend it. You know, so here it is, uh, you know, some data showed some benefit, some data showed a neutral effect. Uh, but again, you know, it is not one of the uh, guidelines uh, that the endocrine society will recommend in the treatment. But, you know, supplement in general, uh, if there is, if it will not cause it, harm, it's good, and as long as the patient getting benefit from it, I do not have a problem with it. There are some, you know, it is like about herbs and improvement of insulin resistant, huh? but there are some articles when you review the literature, you will see neutral effect. So really, from my stand as endocrinologist, I cannot recommend such, you know, herbs uh, uh, to be taken, but if patient wants to take it, I don't have a problem, because simply there is no harm from it. I, I understand. At best, it may reduce the blood sugar minimally. Is, is that correct to say? It could be. Another question is, will my PCP recommend diabetes screening or should, I, or should I ask for it? The screening tests are fasting blood sugar. You can do a hemoglobin A1C and random blood sugar. As I mentioned, to make a definition of diabetes, the fasting more than 126 uh, blood sugar fasting more than 126 on two occasions, random blood sugar more than 200 with the classic symptoms that we talked about it, or hemoglobin A1C more than 6.5. Uh, you know, these are, you know, the uh, probably the best uh, way to screen. Of course, we can do glucose tolerance tests, but we're doing less and less after the introduction of hemoglobin A1C as a, a tool to, the, to make the diagnosis of uh, uh, diabetes. So, we don't do glucose tolerance tests outside the pregnancy at this time. But some, you know, it is like in patient, let us say in patient after a transplant, after a transplant, you cannot depend on hemoglobin A1C. So glucose tolerance tests will be good. Uh, patient with uh, cystic fibrosis, uh, you know, rare, but you cannot depend on the uh, hemoglobin A1C, so you may need a glucose tolerance test in which you do the 75, you, uh, you give the patient 75 gram of glucose and you check the blood sugar at 30 minutes, uh, one hour and two hours, and if at two hours uh, the blood sugar or any time more than 200, you make the diagnosis, if the blood sugar between 140 to 199, we make the diagnosis of impaired glucose tolerance. Another question on artificial sweetener sugar substitutes. Are they linked for, to heart attacks and strokes? The, 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 the viewer is mentioning about a recent study that seemed to say, I think he's, he or she is referring to the sweetener erythritol, which causes increase in that study, increased cardiac issues. Uh, I'm not aware of it. I don't know. And, but I would say the recent article showed worsening of insulin resistance. Now, it will cause heart attack or stroke. You know, you need to look in detail about this study, the individual, they looked at it. Again, you know, as I mentioned, if you want to use it, use limited amount of it. And that's a, probably the best answer I can give. That, that, that's all right, Dr. Saad, because even the review of the article mentioned that occasional use is not good for it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, next question is on metformin and its use not only for diabetes, but also as a longevity drug. Yeah, you know, I was in uh, one of the endocrine society, one uh, top-notch endocrinologist said, well, we need to add uh, two medications to water, 
metformin and statin. Anyway, uh, metformin still, you know, it is a, a potent medication. Uh, it will improve insulin resistance to some degree. It will decrease the glucose production from the liver. Uh, there are, you know, in one of the studies showed that decrease uh, the cardio or cardiovascular benefit in obese patients with diabetes. There are some trials uh, about the use of metformin in decreasing the cancer risk. Uh, you know, cancer, there is increased the incidence of cancer in obese patients. And the reason for this, you have, uh, when the insulin resistance, the insulin level is high, it will stimulate the receptor of hormone called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1. And by stimulation of, the, of this receptor, you are increasing the growth. So that's, we see, you know, more in obese patients increase the incidence of breast, ovarian, pancreatic cancer. So metformin, it showed decreasing, when you decrease the insulin uh, resistant, you may decrease the stimulation of this receptor and may improve, uh, you know, the, uh, it may decrease the chance of cancer. Still question mark, but it is, uh, you know, a lot of people talking about it. So from the point of the heart, you know, of course, there are also some benefit and uh, cancer, there is some benefit. Now there is, as long as the GFR more than 30, metformin is uh, uh, safe. Uh, there are some myths, you know, if metformin will cause renal failure. Metformin will not cause renal failure, but if there is renal failure and GFR less than 30, you should stop taking the metformin. Um, yeah, again, she on that question. What does, if, if somebody asks you to take, to have this uh, beneficial side effects, um, like 1,000 milligrams, 2,000 milligrams? I would start usually with 500 twice a day with food to decrease the GI side effect. As I mentioned, you know, the incidence of GI side effect is up to 10% of the people cannot tolerate it. 5%, you know, they, they really, they will develop significant nausea and uh, diarrhea from it. So I will use, you know, 500 to twice a day, and then I will increase the dose if tolerated to 1,000 twice a day. And there is no risk of hypoglycemia from metformin. And one last question. Uh, can you comment on keto diets and diabetes yeah. and weight loss? Yeah, Keto's, uh, keto uh, genic diet, uh, as I said, you know, important things, the uh, ADA recommend not to do it keto diet in patient who's taking HGLT2 because it will increase the incidence of ketosis and that's number one you know it is like important to uh, uh, you know to uh, understand it when you are taking the ketogenic diet I don't have a problem in patient uh, you know with type 2 it will help in weight loss the problem that I, you know ketogenic mean the carbohydrate even very low you know less than uh, 20, some would say between 20 to 50 gram of carbohydrate per day, some would say even less than 20 gram of carbohydrate. It's, in my opinion, it's hard to sustain it. And uh, you may end up with high LDL cholesterol. So you need to be careful about what you're eating. So, you know, what you're replacing the carbohydrate uh, and, uh, you know, and that's the issue that I have a problem with. But again, it's a good way for weight loss uh, and you will have improvement of the blood sugar, weight loss, but be careful with the LDL cholesterol, and uh, I don't know if it is a sustainable uh, diet, you know, it's hard to, uh, uh, you know, not to eat carbohydrate per day, it's for longer period of time, so that's my concern. Thank you, that's all the questions we have, uh, thank you for such valuable information. Dr. Saad, as I mentioned, practices in Glendora, you can see him as a new patient, and uh, that's all we have for today. We will stop here, but we welcome you again in the next few weeks on another important topic, serving our communities with latest information on health topics. Thank you, Dr. Sa. Thank you.